Welcome to this introduction to chapter 10 in the book Macroeconomics. This chapter is about monetary policy. So now we've come to part 3 in the book, which is about economic policy. And chapter 10 is about monetary policy and chapter 11 is about fiscal policy. And it's important that you understand the distinction between monetary and fiscal policy. So monetary policy is carried out by the central bank and it involves decisions about the money supply and the interest rate. Roughly speaking, you can say that the central bank is lending money to the private sector so as to influence the amount of money and the level of the interest rates in the economy. Fiscal policy is decided by the government and these decisions are prepared by the Ministry of Finance. And fiscal policy involves decisions about government consumption, such as expenditure on education, government investment, such as investment in schools, and transfers, such as pensions, and also about the tax system. These are decisions about the incomes and the expenditure of the public sector, and that is fiscal policy. So monetary policy is about the central bank lending. Fiscal policy is about the government spending and taxing. So this chapter is about monetary policy. And we start by looking at what are the objectives of monetary policy. And then in the main part of the chapter, we analyze how the central bank should react to various kinds of shocks that may affect the economy. And then we look more closely at how monetary policy is carried out in practice. What exactly does the central bank do in order to influence the money supply and the interest rates in the economy? So this chapter is very much about thinking like the central bank, and figuring out how they will analyze the situation and react to events in the economy. So if we start with the monetary policy objectives, we can take the European Central Bank as an example, but it's similar for most central banks. There, the primary goal of the European Central Bank is to maintain price stability. But they also say that Without neglecting this goal, the European Central Bank should support the general economic policy of the European Union with the aim of realizing its general goals. So first of all, when we say price stability, we typically do not mean that prices should be absolutely constant. Rather, we mean that we should have a low and reasonably stable rate of inflation. So what you see here is that Price stability or low inflation is the main objective. And then we're saying that the central bank can try to achieve other things, such as high and stable production, high and stable employment, but only if it's not in conflict with price stability. And in this sense, price stability is the primary goal. And the reason, of course, why this is so is the theory that we have already presented that says that actually monetary policy cannot influence real variables in the long run. And therefore, it would not make any sense to say that the central bank should try to achieve some level of employment or production. Okay, and the model that we will use is the one we have already developed. It's the IS relation that says that production is determined by demand, which consists of consumption and investment. And then we have the money market equilibrium that says that the interest rate is determined so that the real supply of money is equal to the real demand for money, which is the real production divided by velocity. And Finally, we have the Phillips curve that says that inflation depends on three things expected inflation. Uh, the output gap and cost push shocks. So it's important that you remind yourself of these equations 
what do they represent, how do you draw them, what does it mean to move along one of these curves, what kind of factors, exogenous shocks, could shift these curves, because shifting these curves is what we're going to do in this chapter. So furthermore, we assume that the central bank has an inflation target, pi with pizza, or the pizza pie. It's a kind of Greek-Italian thing. And as we know, many central banks today have inflation targets at about 2%. And then in order to analyze shocks, we go about as follows. We assume that we are initially in a situation where production is on its natural level and inflation and also expected inflation are equal to the inflation target, 2%. And this is a long-run equilibrium with a steady inflation and production on its natural level. So, so we actually neglect the growth in income because it's not really important in this context. And um, then we assume that there is some shock, some change in an exogenous variable. And then we ask, what should the central bank do? So here is a graphical picture of this model. And we will use a graphic analysis in this chapter. So on the horizontal axis, we have production. And on the vertical axis, well, we have actually two figures here. The, the upper one, we have the interest rate on the vertical axis. And in the lower one, we have inflation on the vertical axis. And then we have the IS curve, which says that if the interest rate is higher, then that will have a negative effect on consumption and investment. So there will be lower production. We have the LM curve that says that if production is higher, then people need more money for transactions. They are less willing to lend their money, so the interest rate is higher. So therefore, the LM is upward sloping. And then we have the vertical line marking the natural level of production. And in the lower diagram, we have the upward sloping Phillips curve that says that if production is higher, there's going to be higher inflation. And we know that the Phillips curve intersects the line marking the natural level of production at the expected inflation rate. And uh, as I said, we start with a situation where the expected inflation rate is equal to the inflation target. So the Phillips curve intersects the line for the natural level of production at the inflation target. And we assume that production is on that level. And therefore, inflation is going to be equal to the inflation target, provided there are no cost push shocks. So this is the starting point. And then we analyze shocks by, by saying, well, what curve is shifting? And what should the central bank do? So this is really a very powerful model that allows us to analyze a whole range of, of shocks and, and really think like the central bank and say, what would I do if I was sitting on the board of the central bank? What kind of information would I look for in order to take decisions about the interest rate and so on? And I will just outline this here. It's described more in detail in, in the chapter. But we can analyze, for example, the effect of an increase in the demand for money or a shock to aggregate demand, consumption or investment a cost push shock like an increase in oil price shocks to productivity permanent or temporary and also what happens if people suddenly start to expect higher inflation we will quickly discuss a shock to demand for money uh, an aggregate demand shock and an increase in expected inflation so imagine a shock to the demand for money suppose there's a lot of um, credit card fraud so people become worried about using their credit cards and they start to pay more with cash. Well, that means they, they need more cash to make their payments. And that means that velocity decreases. You need more monetary base in order to carry out the transactions. And if you look at the equations, you realize that that means that the LM curve shifts up. So here we see the LM curve 
shifts up here. Then the question is, what should the central bank do? Well, you realize that the LM curve is drawn for a given supply of money. So if the central bank keeps the money supply constant, then we will go from a situation where interest rate is zero, I zero, and production is on its natural level, to a situation where the interest rate is I1, and production is below the natural level. And since production now falls, inflation will fall according to the Phillips curve, so inflation will fall below the inflation target. So if you keep the money supply constant, you will end up in a situation with higher interest rate and production below the natural level and inflation below the target. Now, we know that the primary goal is price stability, but also the central bank wants to stabilize production. So what should they do? Well, the answer is very obvious. Of course, they should increase the money supply and bring the interest rate back to the original level. In that way, they will keep production at its natural rate and inflation in line with the inflation target. So that is quite obvious. And that's what we say here. You increase the money supply so as to keep the interest rate constant. So we learn from this that if there is a shock to the demand for money, those shocks need to be accommodated. That is, if there's an exogenous increase in the demand for money, you increase the money supply. If there is an exogenous decrease in the demand for money, you reduce the money supply. And this is, in fact, what all central banks do in practice. When you read about monetary policy in the newspapers, you read that the central bank has decided to raise the interest rate or lower the interest rate. You do not read that... The, central bank has decided to increase the monetary base by so many billion dollars. So the central bank decides about an interest rate and then they adjust the money supply so as to keep the interest rate on the level that they want it to be. And therefore, in the following, we throw out the LM curve and we focus on the interest rate as the policy variable of the central bank. So let's briefly discuss another shock. Suppose there is an increase in demand in the goods market. So it may be that consumers become more optimistic about the future, that is the expected future income increases, and they therefore start to spend more. So there's higher demand for a given interest rate. Well, that means that the IS curve is going to shift out production is going to be higher for a given interest rate. And we see that in this figure. So what should you do in this case? Well, if you keep the interest rate constant at the original level here, then uh, there will be higher production and higher inflation. If you want to stabilize inflation and production, you want to raise the interest rate to I prime, so as to bring production back to the natural level and inflation back to the inflation target. So that's uh, pretty straightforward. You want to raise the interest rate to counter the shock in aggregate demand. And we can relate this to the long-run analysis in the previous chapters by thinking like this. If there is an increase in expected future income, that will raise the natural real rate of interest. That is what the analysis of the long run showed. So you need an increase in the real rate of interest. And this means that in order to maintain price stability, the central bank must increase the nominal interest rate. So let us consider a third shock, an increase in expected inflation. For some reason, consumers, investors, and price wage setters expect a higher rate of inflation. That will actually affect both the IS curve and the Phillips curve. The IS curve will shift up because at a given nominal interest rate, the expected real interest rate is lower. 
and therefore there will be an increase in consumption and investment for a given interest rate. Furthermore, the Phillips curve will shift up because we know that inflation depends on expected inflation. So there will be higher inflation for a given level of production. And this is illustrated here. And if you stare at these curves and say, well, what does the central bank have to do in order to bring inflation back to the inflation target? Well, they clearly have to raise the interest rate. So we started here. If we keep the interest rate constant, we will have higher production, high inflation. In order to bring inflation back to the target level, we have to raise the interest rate to I1 here so that inflation is kept on the target level. And the upward shifts in the IS curve and the Phillips curve will correspond to the change in the expected inflation rate. And if you stare at these curves, you realize that the interest rate must be raised more than the increase in the expected inflation rate. And this is a version of the so-called Taylor principle. So this idea that the central bank has to react very strongly to changes in inflation was emphasized by the American economist John Taylor. And there's also something called the Taylor rule that is a kind of rule of thumb for monetary policy, which is discussed in the book. So the point is, if expected inflation goes up, the central bank is going to raise the interest rate a lot. This may uh, seem fairly straightforward. You just figure out how much the IS and Phillips curves have shifted, and then you know how much you should change the interest rate. But um, in practice, monetary policy is quite complicated for several reasons. For one thing, we have so far discussed this problem as if the central bank could observe the underlying shocks and react to them. But in practice, there are several complications. The first is that the central bank cannot observe the shocks, the exogenous shocks themselves. But what the central bank can see is the outcomes in the economy, for example, production, employment, inflation, and so on. And the central bank has to use that data in order to figure out what was the shock that led to a change in the situation. Furthermore, this data become available with a considerable time lag. It can take half a year or even a year before they get the clear data on what happened in the economy. And third, you have the problem that monetary policy affects production and inflation with a considerable lag. So if you change the interest rate today, this is not going to affect ongoing investment projects that have already been started. It will affect plans for investment of the firms, and those take a time to realize. So these complications mean that monetary policy in practice is a very delicate uh, art. So as an example about using the data, think of the following news. Suppose that we learn from the Statistical Bureau that inflation has increased and it is now above the inflation target. What will the central bank do? Well, first of all, they will ask themselves, why is inflation above the target? It may be because the expected inflation is high. It may be because we have an overheated economy that is a positive output gap. Or it could be that we have a temporary cost push shock, for example, an increase in oil prices that pushed up inflation. And the central bank is going to use various kinds of data to figure out which of these factors is behind the increase in inflation. And then the reaction of the central bank will be quite different depending on how they interpret the situation. So the central bank will not react in a mechanic way to an increase in inflation, but it will react differently depending on its interpretation of the situation.
And this is all uh, thoroughly discussed in the book. So in the book, there is also a review of the history of inflation. Inflation was quite low in the late 50s and early 60s. Then it increased gradually. It was quite high in the 70s in many countries. And then inflation was brought down. And um, the reasons for this in the background are discussed in the book. And then there is also a discussion about more practically how does the central bank act so as to influence the money supply and the interest rate. In very rough terms, you could say that in order to control the level of interest rates in the economy, the central bank is lending money. And if the central bank lends more money, they increase the monetary base. Recall from chapter seven that the monetary base is the currency in circulation plus the money that the banks have on their accounts at the central bank. And there are various uh, ways in which the central bank can lend money. The classic thing is called outright open market operations. And that means that the central bank buys or sells government bonds short-term bonds such as treasury bills or long-term bonds. And if the central bank buys bonds from a bank, then they pay by crediting the bank's account at the central bank with the amount of money that they pay for the bond. And in this way, they increase the monetary base. And then the bank can use this cash to lend to someone. And this way, the interest rates go down. There's also so-called repurchase agreements, which are similar. The difference is that the central bank may buy a bond with a contract that the bank will buy back the bond in one week, for example. And then during that week, the bank has the cash and the prices of these transactions determine the cost for the bank for having the cash during the week. And that cost is called, a, in Europe, it's called the repo rate. In the US, we talk about the federal funds rate. And then there's also deposit and lending facilities. If a bank has excess cash, then it can be on the bank's account overnight at the central bank. If the bank has a deficit in its account, then it will borrow overnight from the central bank. And the relation between these different operations is discussed in the book. Here is a plot of the different interest rates. But the main point is that by short-term lending to banks, the central bank can affect the short-term interest rate. And there is something called the interbank market, where banks borrow from each other. And for a bank, to borrow from another bank is a very close alternative to borrowing from the central bank or making a repurchase agreement with, with a central bank. And therefore, the rate on repurchase agreements essentially determines the interest rate in the interbank market. But of course, that interest rate between the banks doesn't really matter for consumers or firms directly but indirectly it matters because on the margin the banks can borrow overnight to finance lending over a longer period so therefore the cost of funds for the banks is determined by this overnight money market rate so in this way this interest rate that the central bank can control influences the rates at which banks lend, and also interest rates on deposits and so on. But of course, if I am a firm that is investing, I don't care about what the interest rate is from Wednesday to Thursday or from this Wednesday to next Wednesday. What I care about is what the interest rate will be over the longer term. But the, the interest rate over the longer term will depend on expectations about the future short-term rates. So really what matters for the real economy is the expected path of the short-term rates or the money market rates. So 
What matters is not really what the central bank does today, but what people expect the central bank to do over the next half year or year or two years. And today, monetary policy is very much about managing the expectations about future interest rates. And this all is called the transmission mechanism. That is the mechanism that describes how the actions of the central bank transmit to the decisions of consumers and firms. Okay, so this is a very exciting chapter about monetary policy, where we use everything we have learned to try to really think like the central bank. We start with the objectives of monetary policy, and then we use our well-known IS and Phillips curves to analyze how the central bank should react to a whole range of shocks. Given that, you can observe those exogenous shocks. And then we say, well, actually, the central bank cannot observe the shocks themselves. What the central bank can see is the outcomes. For example, they get data on production and inflation. And then we discuss how the central bank should react to different kinds of news. What kind of information will the central bank use in order to figure out what is happening in the economy. In this chapter, we also review the history of inflation. We discuss the practicalities of monetary policy. What exactly does the central bank do in order to influence the situation in the financial markets? And exactly how does monetary policy feed through into those interest rates that matter for consumers and investors and therefore influence the real economy, the so-called transmission mechanism. So um, in this chapter, we're looking at the economy from the point of view of the central bank. And so good luck with thinking like the central bank.